Okay, I have been asked to announce the um, venue and uh, date of the next All Candidates meeting. It's next Thursday. It's at the fairgrounds and it is also 7 to 10. And um, the only other thing that I've got is that someone came up and said, what's an OCP? I've asked two people and they couldn't tell me. I thought, oh, okay. Uh, the OCP is the official community plan. Uh, it's uh, either a guideline or a bylaw, depending on who you are. And in fact, uh, that's the very next question. Um, this is a question for all candidates. Do you see the OCP as a guideline or do you see it as a bylaw that must be followed? And we'll, sorry, uh, we'll start on that side and go this way. The question is, do you see the OCP as a guideline or do you see it as a bylaw that must be followed? This is a terrible question to ask a lawyer, but uh, my, my, my honest answer is that um, it's as simple as this, if, if, you go on, uh, if you go online, if you go to the Central Spanish Community page, and you go to the hyperlink for the list of bylaws, one of the things that appears is the official community plan. So therefore, in my understanding, while the official community plan may not be technically referred to as a, as a bylaw, it may not have the exact same legal effect that was challenged in court, my understanding is that our commitment as a community to this plan was at the same level uh, as uh, the commitment that we would make to any of the other bylaws about land use, uh, tax, development, XYZ. It's certainly something that I consider the, the people of Central Saanich have put forward as uh, something that they would like to be a, a guideline that, uh, that next councils would follow and something that's not uh, easily dismissed and something that I personally see as very important and uh, I intend to follow the official community plan to the best of my ability as counselor. Uh, the Central Science Official Community Plan is a bylaw. It's bylaw 1600. It was adopted in November 2008, uh, before, uh, the, the, right before the last election, in fact. Uh, it, is, um, it is a bylaw, and it does provide a guide for council. Um, there's, there are very broad and very specific policies in it, and um, I have seen people use that, that, that document in numbers of ways. Developers use it some, in some ways, uh, community groups use it in some ways. It is, there are very broad policies and there are very specific policies, um, directions for council to implement uh, as, as a direction going forward. Uh, I am committed to our official community plan. I think it is a good document. Uh, it was undertaken in a, a community um, a community consult consultative process, and I'm as as I have been over the last uh, uh, three years on council. I've been committed to the official community plan, and I'll remain committed to it, and uh, will support an update of it when that time comes. So, thank you. Thank you. I think you've heard us all basically uh, think the bylaw is also a guideline. And obviously it's a subject to interpretation as uh, recognizing by uh, certain court cases that has taken place that's gone to the Court of Appeal where uh, basically the uh, OCP or the guidelines quote were upheld. So uh, we all have different views with respect to the OCP. Uh, you know, some of us, be, uh, some of us uh, uh, interpret one way, some another, and the council has to interpret as well with public input. So to me, it, it, it is a, a bylaw, but it is a guideline, and, uh, and obviously by the uh, issues that have come before us before, it's obviously, we all have different interpretations of it. I guess I'm going to follow along behind It is a bylaw, is, uh, a, but it is a guide. Uh, we do amendments to our bylaw. Uh, times are changing. They have changed, and we need to change with them. Uh, the fundamental philosophy of the OCP states to achieve harmonious relationship with, with the natural environment, 
Central SANA to integrate environmental, economic, and social considerations together in all decisions relating to growth and change in our community. Have we got contact? Oh, good. So I think it, it is a living document. Did everybody wake up there? <laughs> um, you know, but I'm very proud of our, our OCP. When I first came on council and I, I went to uh, the newbie school, everybody complimented us on what a great OCP we have. It's taken a lot of work. Our community works hard to, to do our OCP and we need to listen to it. We need to be flexible though. Because if, if something comes up and we need to change, we need to, to have that flexibility to be able to change that bylaw. I uh, have to admit, the uh, OCP is a very large document. I have not made it all the way through. Uh, it is bylaw and uh, as such it should be followed. Uh, however, there are times uh, when laws are rewritten and that should be considered a living document with constant updates through the years. I believe this is the fourth generation. Um, and if we stop growing as a community and, and say that you know this is this is it, uh, unfortunately our taxes are really gonna go up because our tax base is just not gonna spread and uh, we will start losing business and uh, that is not good for any of us. The OCP. The OCP is a bylaw and it's a tool of council. It is also a tool of the community to give guidance to our municipal elected officials so that we have a vision of where the community wants to go, but it is not written in stone. We have to be flexible. Nobody should ever get elected that holds the OCP solid and in stone every single time they make a decision. It is a tool for council to help listen to the community, but at times sitting on council, you're going to have to make decisions that might not always agree with the OCP. But the OCP of today wasn't the OCP of the past or the generation before that. It is a document, as Councillor Mason said, that grows and changes with time. We use it as a tool, and it is a living document. Thank you. I have been through three OCP amendment processes. The last one was in 2008, and um, uh, Councillor Bryson and myself chaired that one. Councillor Bryson um, did a, a great job at it. I'm trying to think of different ways to separate myself from <laughs> Councillor Bryson. It's just not working very well. <laughs> um, but the OCP is a changing document. I think, though, when we get to Councillor Thompson, he's done quite a bit of research on how that document has changed over time. And I think one of the interesting things about the OCP, oh, sorry, ex-Councillor ex uh, Thompson, or soon to be. Um, but as you look, <laughs> as you look through uh, the changes that have occurred over time, some of the fundamental guideline, guiding principles and areas set out in the maps have really not. Um, the residential areas uh, where future residentials was, uh, was established, a lot of those come back from OCPs back in the 70s. Um, and uh, the values around agriculture and rural, some of those go way back in that document. And that document is reviewed regularly with the public. It's, it's really the only bylaw that we have that's a bottom-up document. So from that perspective, I think it's very important that council respects it and follows it as much as possible because ideal, in a perfect world, that document should capture the will of the public. And so when we do go through a review process, it's very important for as many of you as possible to be involved in that review process to make sure that those points are in there. Thank you. Uh, 
<coughs> as, uh, as Christopher Graham has just uh, mentioned, uh, we did co-chair the last review of the official community plan. Um, and I, in fairness, I think Chris did a great job too. So um, uh, I am currently the, the chair of planning and development. So, so planning is, is sort of my, my mandate uh, as, uh, as a councillor. And um, uh, I'm, I'm very clear that any decision of council um, by, uh, um, by law has to be consistent with our official community plan. It, it appears though there's some interpretive um, uh, flexibility perhaps in the term consistency and, and that's really um, uh, been the, the subject of, of uh, significant examination recently in the courts etc and, and I think uh, in some ways central science has probably made some, some case law in that regard as to what exactly is the consideration for consistency. but. Where something is being proposed that is not consistent with the official community plan, um, staff bring forward a process, and that is a public process, and the bylaw can only be amended uh, subject to uh, a public hearing. So there is an opportunity for the public to have full input and to provide their comments on any amendment to the to the official community plan. So. Um, there's, there's the requirement that it be consistent, and if the proposal is not consistent, that the amendment process be a full public process. Thank you. In my mind, the OCP is a guideline. It's a map, it's a plan. How many of you have set out to follow a map and a plan and something changed along the way and you had to do it another way? Well, be honest. And, and why did you do that? Because there was a better way to do it. Did you just stop and not do it? Something blocked the road, the road had washed out. Well, I guess I'm going home because I can't get through that way. No, I'm going to find a way around it. If elected to council, I serve you, the people. I think it's important that the OCP remains something that's flexible so that it can evolve, so that it can meet your needs, because if your needs change, I'd like the ability that I can work with a plan that can change with you. I believe that the OCP is a guideline for the direction we want to take our community in. But in an ever-changing community, I think the most important part of the process and keeping those lines of communication open, and that's the job of a counselor, to keep consulting the community as it changes and as the needs grow, and grow with it. It's uh, clearly a bylaw, the fact that when we do make, we'll stick to the minor changes to the OCP at this point, when you make changes to a bylaw and there are minor discrepancies with the OCP, you in fact go through two stages. You have to amend the OCP first before you amend the land use bylaw because those changes to the bylaw have to be consistent with the, uh, with the OCP. When it comes to major changes in the bylaw, the question to me really is what is the intent of the OCP and council has to be looking very carefully what that intent is. In past years, and I'm going back 15 to 20, um, but what councils did with major applications is often put them forward to the next OCP review. Part of the challenge that, that came out, particularly with reference to the co-op de development, that really sh showed what the challenge here is, is I went back and looked at the stats for the last review, and probably, I'm going to guess, one to two percent of the population actually came to those meetings. So a large, and it reflects maybe the voting that goes on, that, that you're looking at a very, very high percentage of the population that is not familiar with the OCP and the regional growth strategy. So when we run into issues like the uh, co-op, for example, in which there was controversy, and this came out with, with people that were concerned. They said, why does the CRD, why is the CRD mucking about in our business and our decisions? Well, the reality is there is this other document called the Regional Growth Strategy over which the, the uh, CRD does have jurisdiction. The, one of the things that I thought about over this next three year term, because we're not looking at any um, uh, review of the OCP in the next three years, having just done one, um, is the opportunity of trying to stimulate the public to learn about what the OCP is and what, their, what the regional growth strategy is so that when we do get to a next review, we understand the consequences of the decisions that we make as a community. Because there's you know, business interests, there's residents, there's agriculture, farming. Um, it's a complex document. So thank you. Does this one work? Yeah. 
So clearly we've heard that it's uh, bylaw, uh, and I concur with that. Um, I think as well, it is uh, a social contract with citizens and other municipalities, not uh, only with, uh, within our own municipality, but I'm thinking as well of the regional growth strategy and, its, and the urban con uh, context statement with other uh, municipalities in the CRD. So the question in part, in my view, is how much do we respect the consensus of the citizens that have been involved in the development of the OCP as well as the stakeholders that we've essentially signed a contract with. Um, now, I understand that uh, there are amendments to, to the OCP, but I think in the past three years, there, they've been far too often the norm rather than the exception. Um, and I would like to say that uh, um, after the recent court case, I'm afraid that what may happen is in the next review of OCPs, they'll be a bit more prescriptive than they have been to date. Uh, in, in the OCPs to date, they've been a little bit more general, but now that that ruling has come forward, I think that the wording, the pressure will be on uh, to have the wording be a lot more prescriptive. my mind is the will of the people. The OCP is reviewed every five years. There should not be any need to tear it to shreds in between those five-year reviews. Little tweaks, maybe, but we have gotten too used to tearing it up, having variances right, left, and center all over the place. We've gotten too used to saying, this is a guideline, when in fact, it's much more than a guideline. It is a vision. If you go to the ACP meetings, APC meetings, you will hear people discuss the OCP in those terms. Those are people who volunteer their time and care very, very much about this municipality. You can say that, oh, only 100 or 180 or 280 people came out to the OCP review and worked on it. But those are the people who care about the community. They came, they went to several workshops, they went out and walked the community in sections that they were working on, and they put their best effort into it, and it's up to us to respect that best effort. So as far as I'm concerned, you won't find me tearing up the OCP, you'll find me doing my best to make sure that the things that come forward meet what the citizens have said they dream of. Thank you. Hi. I do believe in the OCP. I believe that it is a guideline to guide councils in their decision making. I'm aware it is a bylaw. Bylaws can be changed if necessary. I feel it's a tool to assist uh, I believe it needs tweaking. I don't believe it needs tearing up. I'm not actually sure that it's been torn up in the past. Um, I have to say, uh, I'm not sure what the percentage was that Bob Thompson just said. Was it 1.2% of the people that were involved in the last OCP review? That concerns me. And it isn't because those are the only people that cared. It's because those are the only people that had time. There's a great many citizens in this community that are raising families, working, running 100 miles an hour, that would love to, to care about the OCP. And if I'm elected, I will make darn sure that every single one of my friends are part of that consultative process. Because they are not aware of the 1.2% that so-called speak for the rest of the citizens. Um, you know, that's a small demographic, and I thank those people that take the time and, and the interest in doing so, but they don't speak for the entire community. Um, so back to the main question is, I do believe it's a guideline. I do believe it should be upheld, but we would be in danger if we didn't make adjustments to the OCP as our community needs changed. Quite simply, it's both. Beyond the alphabet soup of uh, acronyms, you know, RGS, OCP, UCP, APC, that nobody understands, okay, is a principle. I carry the OCP around with me. I re consult it regularly. 
The point is, there are a number of important principles contained within the OCP, okay, that provide guidelines. Section 3.2, for instance, talks about guiding agriculture. Section 6.2.7 is much more specific and addresses biodiversity in sensitive areas. Policy 1 is consider biodiversity climate change goals such as carbon sequestration, uh, increased efficiency in stormwater management when planting and managing urban trees and landscapes. Why did we incorporate these things into our most recent OCP? Because we came to a realization that these things matter. When we do things that contradict our newest ideas that have been incorporated, we have essentially aband abandoned the OCP. And you can talk about people not showing up or people not being aware. Ignorance is never an excuse. Show up. Get your input in. Make your voice heard. Use the elected counselors. Use the candidates. Use whatever method you can find. I've got a month old child. I've got a volunteer. I've got a job. I've got all these things going on. I still find time. Everyone, everyone can and should and must find time. Thank you. Um, is by any chance Hannah Bush still here? Oh, too bad. I'm sorry about this. I, Hannah Bush is 11 years old, and her question was, if you could make politics into a fun study topic for kids, how would you do it? And I should have asked, because obviously she was here earlier. I'm really sorry I didn't. Um, this one has been asked by a couple of questions, uh, a couple of people. It's for all candidates. This time, I guess we'll start here and we'll go around. Um, do you support infill subdivision in existing neighborhoods? And if so, how do you ensure that the character of those neighborhoods is maintained and not changed by the infill? Ah, oh, shucks, I'd much rather uh, answer the question by Hannah. <laughs> Uh, I think what it boils down to is that we, uh, again, have to have a plan rather than uh, a case of spot zoning. Uh, we need to have an idea of what we want our areas to look like. Uh, and it, the, the needs and concerns of the existing residents have to, have to, have to be addressed. That doesn't mean there isn't an opportunity. It just means that they have to be addressed. Thank you. I too would have to say that's a difficult question to answer without more information. Um, and I did say I would answer the questions to the best of my ability tonight. So without more information, that would be very difficult for me to answer. I think we would need to get public input. And I know that densification is coming up for study uh, with the municipality um, right after I believe the new council is in. Um, and I think at that time, those questions can be addressed. Um, what exactly does infill mean? I think that has a lot of different uh, variations to it, and I can't give you a straight answer on that as much as you might like one. Sorry. I think the question needs to be addressed street by street and neighborhood by neighborhood. There is a lot of educational work that needs to be done around this, but there's also a lot of listening that needs to be done. Um, people moved into a place expecting that that place was going to remain the same for a very long time. So we need to be very, very careful about the kinds of changes we're bringing to them and that the changes fit into the neighborhood. There's, we have all the time in the world to figure these things out and we need to take that time. And one of the real problems that we've been having is that People find developments cropping up all around them. They go to council, they want to have an equal say with the developers, and they often feel they haven't had that chance. And we need to make sure that every voice is heard. So again, this has to be done neighborhood by neighborhood and street by street, and I am most happy to go to any street in this municipality and sit down and talk to them about what they would like to see what changes they're willing to accept, and what they absolutely don't want. Thank you.
Well, I have to admit I agree with many of the comments that have uh, preceded me. And um, I don't think you want the fast answer, I think you want the best answer here. One that's uh, thought out, and so certainly uh, this, this requires consultation uh, with the community, with those residents, that, that neighborhood for example. Um, fully agree that it can upset people. That's why when I was elected, I went knocking on doors between elections, not only in election time. So uh, if I am elected again, you can uh, d not be surprised if I start knocking on your door. <laughs> uh, this has been an issue I've been uh, working on. As some of you know, for the last year and a half or two as a private citizen as chair of the Advisory Planning Commission, um, which led to council initially approving and then ultimately going to the next council, the residential densification study. Uh, we live clearly in a mixed community, suburban, rural, and for many of us, our little 8,000 square or 6,000 square foot lots is our acreage, and privacy is extremely important to people. The, the value of going through a residential study, uh, densification study, because I'm not, again, it comes down, I'm not sure if it's something that people want. We've looked at it from smart growth principles because we've got a pretty tight boundary. We are running out of, there is very little, in fact, there's about one or two spots in the municipality where you could do greenfield development and, and less than 10 acres. So that land is rapidly being consumed. The studies that were done through uh, Wayne Hunter's councils and so forth relied on you know, this concept of looking at different types of housing. We didn't want just single family housing. So we're running into this um, uh, conflict, really, between residential areas and some of the policies in the OCP. Um, part of it is a creative process that looks at different options. I know at the APC one night we talked all about growing up in 1,000 square foot homes, and now homes tend to be larger, which is causing some of the privacy issues. So I, I, I think, and, and looking at the cost, I've talked to members of council about this, what's the reality of densification and the cost of providing affordable housing. It's great to talk about affordable housing, it's very, very difficult to uh, create in this municipality. So I think the residential densification study would be key. Do I support infill housing? Um, I don't think as a councillor it's my job to support or not support anything. It's my job to hear what the community wants and keep the process open and make sure that all the lines of communication into that council chamber are being fed to everyone in the community, not just the select few people in that, community, that affected area. So to me, again, the reoccurring theme seems to be the process, and I want to uphold the process and continue on the good work that the council does to follow the community plan and meet the needs of all the citizens. I have the opportunity once a month, well, if we're lucky, if we have enough on the agenda, to sit around the table with Bob and a number of other residents, where we get to look at examples, proposals, ideas. And I like the idea of taking a good community look at each case. I don't believe in brush strokes. I'd like to give every piece of opportunity a thorough look, because what's going to work beside my house may not work so well beside Bob's house or Zeb's house. And I believe that it's important. It's too bad. I, I would say, come on out. Although our meeting for this month got canceled, we usually meet about the third Wednesday. And I think we're just as exciting as a council meeting. But what we represent is a group of people that work as a team. I've come to appreciate that, that we look at ideas, but we look at it with a team approach where, where I represent a niche. I was, I, for a while there, I was the guy with the young kids. So if a proposal had a playground with the kind of material that isn't fun, I could say, you know what, my kids don't like that. Those toys, they don't understand it. And I look to my fellow commission members for their expertise because I don't profess to be an expert in things I don't know. I can bring to you what I know, what I've learned in, in my, my 39 years, but I like the opportunity to work with a team where I can lean on other people where I know they've got expertise. And one of my strengths is to get behind that decision, that team, and help move forward. So if it works for that spot, great. If not, then let's look at what might work better for that spot. Uh, thank you. Back a, a little bit further in history, um, when uh, um, Chris Graham and I were chairing the, the OCP steering committee, uh, we were getting close to having a document, a draft document that we were prepared to bring to council for the OCP review in 2008. And um, at the steering committee meeting, I, uh, I, I appreciate that we had 
uh, come up with the concept of densification and uh, um, but I, I, I think I actually used the words that I felt we, we had perhaps uh, a bit of a cop out in terms of um, really coming up with clear enough criteria for the community in terms of what that densification would actually look like. The compromise, I, I, didn't, I didn't manage to persuade enough people to, to actually uh, really develop the area of what densification would mean in neighborhoods. Um, but uh, the, the compromise that you will see in the Fisher Community Plan is we got a line diagram from uh, Bruce Gregg, which is a lovely diagram showing the tapering of density from our village cores outwards. Um, however, the, the current council does does deserve some credit in terms that we, we have budgeted the money and we've actually, uh, I sat on a, a, a committee uh, going through the consultants and uh, we have actually allocated a contract for the densification study and the criteria are a high priority and we'll be doing that at the, the, the beginning of the new council. Yeah, the need to identify, to build infill guidelines is uh, the need for that is identified in the uh, 2008 OCP. But I think that, I, I, to answer the question, yes, I believe in infill. There are places where it is appropriate. It's also a part of a, of a cycle of redevelopment that happens. Um, I know some of some people are quite fond of what's happened in Rampa Bay. Some people are, are very concerned about it. What will help help in the, our future quite a bit is going through this process coming up with the uh, infill gut where we're going to define infill guidelines. Hopefully, I think uh, the community needs that broader discussion. I think council needs to hear that broader discussion from the community to get a sense of what's acceptable. Um, I think we have to make sure that infill doesn't come at the expense of neighborhoods. It, people live in a neighborhood for a reason, they like that character. I think if there's going to be any infill in there that it meets, that it, that it blends in with that character, and it's acceptable to that neighborhood. When I was on council, I would only support applications that were acceptable to the neighborhood. And uh, I definitely would not be ramming things through. Thank you. I supported the densification study. The OCP guides us in making sure that we look at infill whenever possible in our urban areas. Not all of the development has happened in those areas, but that is where the primary focus is. Each project has to stand on its own justification, both to the public to the staff and to the council. Each one has its own merits and it has to go through the process to get approved. We listen to the public and we make decisions based on what's good for the area and the entire municipality. Thank you. Infill just uh, puts two houses where one used to be, twice the neighbors, just like that. Um, I think infills may have a, a place, but without 100% uh, uh, feedback from the neighbors and approval from the neighbors, uh, I don't think this should happen at all. I think that uh, infills um, take away from the look of the neighborhood. They take parking stalls away from the neighbors, and you're putting more people in the area that is not designed for them. In our OCP, under Guiding the Future Managing Growth, Policy 4, sensitive residential infill and intensification will be considered in areas designated for residential uses within the urban settlement area. That's in our OCP. Here's an example where I think perhaps we have to rethink that. I won't, we won't know until we go out to the public for the last year, I pushed to have that the uh, densification, residential densification study 
looked at formulated and that we need to go out to the public we need to get their input what I've seen in the last couple of years is neighborhoods coming in very upset because of infill and uh, I think there there is a lack of understanding and, uh, and a lack of buy-in by the community at this point so I think we need to to have that conversation we need to listen and uh, and, and, and inform the public. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, what Councillor Mason just read gives you the indication of the OCP and how people interpret it in different ways. We have now an OCP that uh, says us to look at densification and we have uh, neighborhoods that are very upset. So I think the residential uh, dens densification study that we're going forward will probably help give uh, both parties, uh, council and the residents, uh, a little more comfort. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I uh, also uh, take the direction of the official community plan to look at these in sensitive, in, in sensitively within the neighborhoods. Um, certainly the focus is to manage growth uh, within our urban settlement areas and uh, to, to uh, restrict growth as much as possible outside of the uh, urban settlement areas. Uh, what I would, what I'm going to add to this to this discussion, though, is just a little bit about the approach. And what I've learned from from watching the development community at work is that they've done a very, they've they've become very skilled at developing open areas. And where there's open areas, there's very few neighbors. And I've noted that uh, when we're when they're now operating in neighborhoods that have people, that they're not actually that skilled at it. Um, at the, the neighborhood part of it, uh, they they want to they want to take the land that they have and and try to capitalize on it, and it it's not done in the most the the policy says sensitive. It's not done in the most sensitive way, and I think that as we and we're not the only community in the world that's got uh, urban containment boundaries. Most communities in in North America and, and a lot of communities around the world have urban settlement areas. So I think that as we start to um, make decisions to have our growth happen in focused areas, that there is going to be a requirement for an evolution within the development community to learn how to communicate with the neighbors properly. And what I've seen is that it's very ineffective to actually come and drop a development. This is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it in your neighborhood. That doesn't work, and it, it is not a very good way to introduce yourself to your neighbors. So I think that um, I think that there needs to be some work in this residential densification densification study in that area. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, I agree with what uh, some of the other candidates have said to the extent that uh, these kind of decisions are the meat and potatoes of what uh, uh, municipal and the council does, and that they, each decision does need to be uh, assessed at, at a case by case basis, but. Um, if that's done properly, other residents' voices will be given equal uh, credit to the voices and perspectives of those who would want to develop. But I don't want to keep it as just a, a very safe answer in that way, because I think that this question speaks to some of what my priorities for uh, the, the larger community are. Um, so basically I see it as this. We have uh, accrued a, a, a large amount of um, of uh, future debt in terms of our, our spending uh, commitments. And so whatever anybody says at this table today, I know and you know that the next council is gonna be under tremendous pressure to increase revenues. And there are three basic ways that I see that we can do this, three basic ways to increase the tax base and the revenue that we have as a municipality. One is to increase commercial and business investment. The second is to increase uh, property taxes by uh, some combination of densification, infill, rezoning. And the third would be to cut services. Now, I don't want to cut services. And I think that in looking at ways to increase the commercial and business investment into our, the zones that we already have allocated for that kind of practice is the best priority, is the best of those three options. And that's the one that I intend to pursue as a first priority. Um, Thank you. Okay. We are now at uh, 5 to 10, so I lied when I said we finish at 10 because the candidates have yet to make a final statement. Uh, 
uh, one minute each. And so we will start off with uh, the two mayoral candidates reversing the order from the beginning, and then we'll go back the other way around. about the time, otherwise. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to everybody who's hung in here this evening. Um, I'm glad to see that we have a wide range of candidates here. I think I can work with any of these people as a, as a leader for the community, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what the community selection is. Uh, I also want you to thank, thank uh, Christopher Graham for running, because I think the only thing worse potentially than not getting elected would actually be being elected by acclamation and as a new mayor because um, then potentially uh, it would be challenged on the basis that nobody else really wanted the job. So um, I, I appreciate that we've got a full spectrum of people here and uh, uh, I hope that the decision making you will use is actually what tools people bring to their decision making rather than the specific items they've identified this evening because you just don't get to choose the issues that come in front of you at council. It doesn't work that way. You need to identify people who can be useful in terms of the toolkit that they're going to bring to the diversity of the opinions at the table. Thank you. Thanks for putting up with us for the last three hours. Um, I know it's difficult on this end, it must be really hard on that end. And I'm glad to see that we didn't identify any crazies, that's always a big plus. Um, I mean that as a joke too, sorry. <laughs> I know the night's, the night's late. Um, I think we have uh, two very good candidates running for mayor, at the very least two similar candidates, some people might say. Um, I just want to quickly run this down. Uh, please support me for mayor. What I think draws me as out to be a different candidate is I have twice the experience on council having served 12 years. I found the people of Central Sanch money. I've kept your costs down. I have lots of enthusiasm to share with council. I have the necessary leadership and multi-jurisdictional experience, having chaired and sat on many boards. And I've been directly involved in many accomplishments that benefit Central Sanch and the region. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out tonight. Central Fanage faces many challenges in the coming months and years ahead, challenges which will require serious funding, careful planning, and execution. I will bring my council, board, and business knowledge and community service record to council and continue to make the right decisions for our community and make sure that they're implemented. My objective is to bring to you a community that has a balanced approach to growth, I will continue to work diligently to cultivate initiatives and to boost the local economy so the district will be sustainable and prosperous, while never losing the vision of maintaining a green community. One of the most attractive reasons for living in the district of Central Saanich is its rural setting and high quality of life. Preserving this quality of life for your family and mine is my top priority. Thank you. Thank you all for uh putting up with me. I hope you can tell that uh, I am not a career politician. I tend to say what's on my mind. Um, the benefit of that is that you actually know where you stand with me. Um, also, I'm not afraid to admit that I'm wrong and uh, I will learn and um, I will listen to you. The job of counsel is to not make decisions for you, but make decisions with you. I hope to get a chance to serve for you. Thank you. I'm going to say it again, we need a stable, balanced council that would make good, common sense decisions, ensuring that we maximize the opportunities open to us and find solutions to the challenges. I care, I'm concerned, I'm committed, and I listen. So, please vote for me, Susan Mason, a positive voice, on November 19th. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the Ratepayers Association for the opportunity uh, that's been given to us tonight. I guess if you look around here, you have 15 well-qualified people to, before you with all sorts of skills and backgrounds, uh, all which would be an asset on council. So I guess in casting your vote, I would just ask you to consider the skills and experiences presented to you here tonight and how you could, uh, uh, how they could serve you on your council. And I believe I have the skills and the experience to contribute again to this council and basically would ask you to consider me for one of your votes. Thank you. We're a privileged and, and safe community. While many communities in our world struggle immensely, we should be celebrating our place. I don't think for one minute that we should ignore our issues, but we should put our issues into perspective. In my opinion, there's been not enough focus on the accomplishments of our council. We've completed an agricultural area plan. We've implemented the integrated stormwater management plan. We finally had the amendment to our soil deposit and removal bylaw approved by the province after 15 months. And we began to take real action in Saanich Inlet, which is, I'm quite proud of. I'm committed to continuing to build relationships across political, social, and cultural barriers, building on the confidence and experience and understanding I've gained to provide even better leadership into the future. It's important for me to continue to be an open and honest decision maker, always only just a phone call or email away. Thank you again. Central Saanich is a very important place for all of us. I'm asking for your support on November the 19th so I can continue to work with my colleagues at the table to address the challenges and nurture the opportunities. Thank you. Thanks again to all of you, uh, to the uh, Ratepayers Association and to the Coast Salish people for giving us the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I'm asking again for your vote as a resident, a father, as a representative of a younger generation, and as someone with experience and understanding of the law. Uh, as council, I hope to bring a change to the bitter and rancorous tone of local politics. And as far as my policy, I hope to hold the line on debt and taxes, to rejuvenate Keating Cross and our other uh, residential uh, business and commercial districts, uh, to restore the civic spirit of our community, and to bring back a neighborly spirit and uh, transparency to local governance. And I hope you'll give me the chance to do that by voting for me on election day. Thank you. I'd like to talk a little bit about values. When I first stood before a council in about 2005 and applied to be on one of four different commissions, I was asked, why are you trying to be on four different commissions? I said, because one day I want to be on council and I want to make sure I get a chance to be on a commission. And they gave me a chance, I got on one. I'm a team player. As I mentioned before, I can get behind the team. I can support that and I can make it work. Finally, I'm hard working. When Ian offered up the chance for to have a table here, I said, no, that's all right, Ian. I want to be outside. I want to meet people face to face when they come in. A table's too passive for me. So I raced out here from work, and I think I was tied with the AV guy to be the first guy in the parking lot because I didn't want to miss a single one of you. And I'm not going to leave here tonight until Ian says, Carl, that's it. There's nobody left. <laughs> come talk to me. If you don't have a brochure, I'd love to chat with you. I'm here to serve you. Let's chat right now. My name is James McNulty. Uh, I'm a local business owner out here. At that business, I'm faced with a lot of the same decisions the house council's been faced. When to invest, when to save. And that's the experience that I'm gonna bring to the table. And there's been a lot of great questions tonight, and there's been a common theme to me, and it's a breakdown of communication between the council and the community. It's, as a councillor, it's really important to ensure that the lines of communication remain open. So we can have the commentary, ah, there it is. <laughs> so we can have the conversations necessary to understand the complex issues that we face as a community. We must always remember that it's not council's role to dictate policy. It's rather to speak with the community and enact the will of the people. Let's not find fault. Let's find solutions. Thank you very much and thank you for giving me the second chance.
I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet. Thank you for coming, and thank you to the rape pairs. I know it's been a long evening. Um, I guess in summary, it is a very special place that we live, and I believe that I have both the council, work, and life experience uh, combined with the knowledge of the diversity of opinions in our community uh, to help Central Sandwich Council make balanced and respected decisions for the whole benefit of the community that uh, balance the needs of the residents, businesses, and farms, for example, and uh, to keep those within the context of the community plan. Thank you. Once again, thank you for this opportunity. I've been out every day knocking on doors because I want to hear from you, and not just because it's an election going on. And if you see me, you tell me what's on your mind. I'm listening. I promised you open, transparent government, and I outlined how I plan to do that. When you read the minutes, they will reflect transparency. Minutes are like a scorecard for the voters. I promise you'll like my score. Let's get back to sensible spending. We have to make tough choices so that your families can afford to live here. Together, we can turn things around. Go visit my uh, table over on the side where we have some cookies. Uh, get there fast, however, I was going to say that it's written here. Get there fast because we don't have the many, although there's fewer people in the room now. <laughs> there are 20 days left, I believe, till the election is over, till voting day. So vote for me, Zeb King. And what's really disturbing me is that more and more each day the applications that I'm getting for low-income subsidized housing are coming from working people in central Saanich. I can name every street in this community and tell you that there is someone out there in need of help. So my job, if I get on council, is going to be to use my voice and your ideas to make sure that our community is healthy and safe and affordable for all of our citizens. Thank you, and vote for Sue Stroud on November 19th. Hi, I'd like to just start by thanking everybody that has hung in here until the bitter end. It's been a long evening, and thank you to the Ray Payers. I'd also like to thank all my fellow candidates. We all have one thing in common, and that is we all care for our community or we would not be here. Um, I feel I would bring to Council a well-balanced, common-sense attitude and approach, good decision-making skills. I am a team player, as well an extensive financial and business background. So I would hope that you would vote for me on November 19th. Kathy Almstead, thank you. Uh, I will start by showing the traditional sign of thanks to the Coast Salish people. And also to everyone in this room uh, for speaking in. Uh, we listened indeed to a lot of information from us this evening. And uh, I want to be clear about one thing and one thing only. I'm here to work with everyone in this room and everyone who lives in this municipality. That's the people on this council and everywhere else. Why do I need, why, why will I do that? As I said when I opened, it's about protecting small business, agriculture, our sensitive areas, and holding a balance between those priorities. In addition, we have issues like reasonable taxation, debt, that have to be addressed. And I'm willing to do that with these individuals and with you, the public. Uh, I bring with me uh, quite a bit of educational background at the University of Western Ontario, public uh, policy, and uh, also UBC. So on November 19th, please vote for Ryan Windsor. Thank you. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I will be the last person to say thank you very much for coming out. As Winston Churchill said, democracy is a terrible form of government, but it's better than all the rest. Thank you very much. Get out and vote. I'm sure you will.